Hello, and welcome to the debrief from the business of fashion, where each week we go deep on our most popular BOF professional stories with the correspondents who created them. I'm Lauren Sherman. I'm away on assignment this week, so we have a special edition of the debrief for you, a live session where I interview BOF editor Diana Pearl regarding a recent story she wrote on the changing dynamics of the influencer economy. We were joined by James Nord, founder of Four, and Lindsay Gerudis, general manager of ShopStyle Collective at ShopStyle. It's an ever-moving conversation, and I hope you enjoyed this update on the market, and I will talk to you next week. We are here to talk about the state of the influencer economy. We're going to speak about what's changing in the creator market right now and how brands can better work with influencers in a way that you actually see an ROI. And Diana, I think it would be great to start and set the scene. The story you did recently, I think I edited it with you about the changing face of the influencer in terms of their occupation. Can you talk a bit about what the piece was about and what it said about the broader influencer market. Yeah. So the headline was why you should hire an influencer with a day job. And that really sums it up. We've seen over the past couple of years, the rise of this sort of influencer who is not famous for being an influencer. They're known for something else. A couple of examples were Chrissy Jones, the founder of Sky Ting Yoga, James Whiteside. He's the principal dancer at the American Ballet Theater. Um, Eva Chen is one of the original like day job influencers, of course, the head of fashion partnerships at Instagram. And basically these people are increasingly attractive to brands because they're not just known for having influence on social media. They have something else that kind of gives them credibility. They have a loyal following, not just for their social media presence, but the connection that they have to something else that maybe gives them that extra layer of legitimacy and just something else for people to follow along with and be interested in. Also, because these people have a day job, a lot of times their recommendations and their content feels very authentic because they're not always just looking. And obviously lots of creators are not also looking to sell you things, but It's really just about their lives. And in a lot of ways, that's very relatable. Even if these people have a really glamorous job, it is still a job, a nine to five in a way that, you know, the average follower also probably has a nine to five. So it's something that they can relate to, even if those nine to fives look very different. And in many ways, you think about the early days of creators and influencers before they were even called creators and influencers. That's what a lot of bloggers or YouTubers back in the day, they had day jobs and this was something they did as a hobby. And that's how a lot of people found creators initially. So it's sort of a return to the old days in a way. Yeah. One of the creators in this space that I think is really interesting is Layla Gohar, who is a a chef and sort of an artist chef. She's been doing fashion dinners for years and the food itself is not really the point. It's how she presents the food. And she just had a big New Yorker profile that was really interesting. And she does partnerships with like Hermes and, and these big brands and they love her. They'll have her come and do work for their events. She's a really interesting example of one of these influencers with a day job, as you said in your story. So James, if you could really quickly chat about what four is, and then also what Diana is talking about, how you've seen the market evolve in the last couple of years. So very briefly, we said we're an ambassador marketing company. We have a technology platform that lets brands find, analyze, organize, work with influencers on their own. And we have a services side of the business where we'll run campaigns and for clients. For instance, we do Sephora Squad, which is probably the most known, most public kind of work that we do. That's our program. We run all that work for Sephora. I talked to Diana about this piece, and I think it's definitely something we have seen more of. And part of it is audiences are connecting with these influencers that have day jobs that maybe feel more relatable, right? As an influencer, as their following grows quite a bit, they just get like quite rich and their lives become pretty unrelatable. And the people that started following them for Forever 21 hauls, when they are talking about a limited edition Kelly bag they got, it stops being the content you signed up for. That's part of it. But brands are are looking to tell kind of just different and more diverse stories. And so being able to pull in someone's job into a sponsored post, an example, I think Diane and I talked about was like newly, uh, they work with one of our employees who has a bit of a following on TikTok and Instagram. 
And she's able in those posts to say, hey, you know, I I have this full-time job. I want to be wearing new looks to the office as we're going back into the office. And so Newly is a great way for me to do that and to have all these cute clothes without having to buy them. And she can tell a story that is more like relatable to the use case that the normal Newly customer would have. And so her having that job gives that like extra bit of story that the brand can kind of latch on to and use to help tell their brand story. And just for people who live outside of the U.S., can you explain really quickly what Newly is? Yeah, it's a subscription rental service for clothing. So you get, I think, three to five pieces a month, similar to Rent the Runway, but with like younger, I think more like Gen Z brands. Yeah, it's owned by Urban Outfitters. So it's a lot of their brands, but some cooler brands too. Lindsay, same thing with shops. I'm sure most of the people on this call know what shop style is, but essentially how shop style works with creators and influencers and how this kind of shift in the profile of the influencers is changing the way you operate. So ShopStyle Collective is an influencer marketing platform. And we like to say that, you know, we're really here to help open the influencer slash creator world to all storytellers. So we really pride ourselves on really opening and, and allowing creators of all shapes, sizes, backgrounds to be able to be successful. And that actually, we even apply storytellers to our marketing partners as well, because they're also trying to tell a story. Like we know that the influencer space is a murky one, and we really want to be here to be a guide for everybody in the best way to monetize and to maximize exposure. So, you know, we have two key ways that we really work with creators. We have our affiliate platform. So many of you probably know ShopStyle. That is a shopping comparison site. It is built off of an affiliate platform. And so what we did was we built technology so that our creators can tap into the retailers and the affiliate networks at large. So we are essentially a sub affiliate network where we allow them to tap into that and track all their sales and earn an organic living via affiliate links, which we think is really important because sort of as James said, and everybody has talked about diversifying revenue streams for both our creators and our marketers is incredibly important as the, as the industry is evolving. And I think it's so important to understand the data from top to the bottom of the funnel to really be able to evaluate the success of a campaign. And then the other way that we work with creators is via campaigns. We do that sort of the same way that many other agencies work but really try to weave in the data piece of it, the affiliate piece of it, the tracking piece of it into the recommendations that we give to our marketers and our creators. And so, you know, evaluating the best match between a marketer and a creator and an influencer based on previous history, the KPIs for that campaign and and additional sales data. So Going back to the story that Diana did, we've 100% seen the evolution of the more relatable creator. And I actually, you know, it's interesting because I think it also even ties back to the sort of idea of micro creators versus the big macro ones, right? I mean, we know that these very niche content, which oftentimes can relate to somebody's job, right? So, you know, dermatologists can come in and talk about specific skincare problems and that can really bring in a very engaged audience. And that actually has been incredibly helpful for marketers because you're leveraging a very specific, very excited audience who wants to convert, wants to know more, can become a longtime customer. And so I think that these sort of authentic nine to five folks are also really able to engage audiences in a much more unique and and really exciting way. And it's just sort of an interesting trend that's happening in this space. In some way, it's more aspirational. Thinking, you mentioned dermatologists, I'm thinking of friend of BOF, Dr. Nigma, who many of you may follow, but she's just so cool and interesting. You moved from London to LA and she's a holistic doctor and her advice and things, it, it, sometimes it is, it does feel, and Diana, maybe you could speak to this, this nicheification of everything in the world. Do you think that this shift in the market is just, another result of the fact that everything is micro, micro, super focused now. And so your influencer, your creators need to be that way too. Yeah, definitely. I mean, A, I think there's like a number of sort of factors that have led to sort of this nicheification. I think A, the line between creator and regular social media user has never been more blurred than it is now. I can think of four people off the top of my head who like aren't traditional influencers, but they post sometimes like just people I follow in my life. And they post sometimes like they're an influencer. They share their shopping pics. They might only have 500 followers. 
But even just if those are their friends and family, if they're sort of a trusted source within their friends and family, word of mouth, maybe they start getting a thousand followers and then 2000 and 3000. And also I think we see about things like TikTok, which every niche interest, no matter how niche you might think your interest is, like there is a community on TikTok that is making content about it. So I think that platform has really put that into overdrive because it's so much easier now to find that niche content versus on Instagram. TikTok, I feel like has really exploded because of how easy the discovery is. So I think that we have smaller creators or budding creators or aspiring creators or just normal social media users who are wielding the influence that they already had in their own lives. Now they're wielding it online. You you know, maybe 10 years ago, you had a friend who always looked great. Her makeup looked great. You'd ask her in person, hey, what lipstick do you like? Now she's posting about that on Instagram. You know, we have these small users who, who have a lot of influence within their own worlds and spheres, and then also just easier to find the people that are interested in what you're interested in. James, could you speak to how is it reflected in the actual revenue that these influencers are bringing in? What influencers are getting paid? Do they need to diversify their revenue streams in different ways? Are pay per post, is that getting lower or is it just as high because the conversion is good? How is it changing the economics of all of this? We saw a huge increase in influencer pay over the last couple of years. I think from 2020 to mid 2021, it went up like 48%, much of it being demand. And I think it has probably stabilized a bit. I think what we're seeing for individual influencers is that as there are a lot more options and a lot more people to work with, there's more supply and brands have a lot more to choose from. When I started this business, there was 50 people making money on the internet, maybe like the Brian boys, like that was it. And now there are millions and millions of people making money off the internet doing this. And that means that you have to be better, that you have to probably work harder for it, that Because there is more supply, prices might start to fall a little bit if people say, well, I'm not getting as many deals, so maybe I'll consider lowering my rates. What's interesting about the influencer space still is that there is a fairly large separation, I think, from high performers and lower performers. And this is something I'm sure Lindsay sees a lot of as well, especially on the conversion side. And so those influencers that can produce results, you know, that can drive sales, that can drive the results brands want or who have content that is really beautiful, can help change a brand's perspective. Like they're still able to command pretty high prices. But I think I'm seeing generally that people are still getting as much per post, but there are some influencers who two years ago were getting five brand deals a month are getting one now. And that there's some people who are just getting less inbound brand deals, not because the appetite for influencer marketing has decreased quite the opposite, but because the supply of who they can work with has increased so much. And we're also seeing the first generational shift in this industry in quite some time. When I started the business, everybody who was doing this was photo and caption. Like that was it. It was either photo and blog post or photo and caption. And we spent years perfecting that model. And now we have a new generation that's video first And older kind of traditional influencers are one, just being aged out. It's always exciting to work with young people. Like that's just a fact of marketing, like it or not. And we are seeing this younger generation that creates content in a different way, that has a different point of view, starting to take brand deals away from people who two years ago were batting people away and being able to have their pick of of what they were doing. So you mentioned conversion and Lindsay, I'm really interested to hear from you on that in particular, especially as we move to video, like something like the Nordstrom anniversary sale. I know that used to be a huge revenue driver, not only for influencers, but big media publications as well. And and maybe it still is. But what are you seeing in terms of actual click through, especially now that people are moving to video? Has the tracking on video, whoever is doing that, been able to perfect that in the same way that it was eventually perfected on Instagram? And also just how much is conversion and tracking still a big part of this? Or is it more about the quality posts and less about how many click-throughs you get, that sort of thing? So it's really interesting. And actually what James was saying made me think about it a lot because 
we've seen over the last couple of years that marketing teams on the brand side have been kind of fusing together a little bit more than they did in the past. So it used to be like brand teams over here or PR teams over here and performance teams over here and like never the twain shall meet. And that's really not the case anymore. A lot of times those budgets are being combined. And so what used to happen where it was like, well, I have a brand budget and there's very separate KPIs for that brand budget versus a performance budget, which has conversion sales ROI budget, very separate. Now they're the same. And sometimes they're not necessarily more. It's like, oh, I'm just going to give you the same amount of money, but I'm going to look for both KPIs. And that's can be an interesting place to try and fulfill with the wide variety of creators, because those creators that are going to hit brand awareness, you know, really big folks that may command those big dollars are not necessarily going to fit in a budget that also needs to hit performance ROI. And so there's a lot of navigating this dance of who can we sort of work with. And then, you know, as far as conversion goes on video, I mean, it's a really interesting question. I don't think that there's a issue when it comes to the tracking. I think there's still an issue with how the consumers are expecting to convert in a video experience, right? It's like when you're as a consumer enjoying videos and you're going from one to the other, the ease slash the sense of urgency slash the overall experience really makes it difficult to pop out, buy something and then pop back in. As a result, we actually, I mean, we really talk a lot with our creators about having a very diverse set of revenue streams and also a diverse set of ways in which they interact with their audience so that they can drive sales even amidst or sort of in spite of all this video that's being created. So you don't want to necessarily as a creator be beholden to one particular social media platform, one particular type of content. You want to have a really wide variety of ways in which you're interacting with your audience, including your O&O properties, newsletters, even text messages, because the actual conversion is often happening in those kinds of experiences, right? That's where, you know, you think about sort of like the overall user journey in the funnel to sort of getting to the purchase, it tends to take like several times at this discovery level to see it in a video. And it's like, you know, everybody has this TikTok made me buy it. I mean, how many times did you have to see that thing in a video to actually go and buy it? Right. And so it takes a long time. And so what can happen is that you get exposed, exposed, exposed. And then finally you get a text message about it being on sale, or you get an email that it's available in some place. And so, you know, we really, really often counsel and see there's a lot of opportunity. And in fact, like 86% of our creators have their own O and O properties that they lean into to drive that conversion. What's an O and O property? Owned and operated. I'm sorry. I should say owned and operated. So they own their audience. They own that property. They're not reliant on social media. Like it's not anything that goes on a social media platform because that's reliant on the whims of that algorithm, right? And on any given day, it can kill your business, unfortunately. Diana, how are you seeing this all play out with this class of influencer who does presumably make money off of something else other than creating? I think a lot of them, this ends up being a bigger revenue stream than their actual job, but that's the idea. Totally. Well, I think A, they're sort of in a unique place because they have another revenue stream in the form of their day job. It's not like they're completely relying on their influencer work in order to like pay their bills and pay their rent. So I think they can be a little bit pickier with what deals they take on. I think the point that Lindsay made about the owned and operated properties, I mean, I definitely think that's something with the creator world at large that we're seeing is just more and more like diversifying of the revenue streams and really trying to have things like a website or a newsletter that you own the audience, you have a direct relationship with them, and it's not going to go away overnight if Meta or Facebook or Instagram changes their algorithm. I think with a day job influencer, you actually see a little bit less of that because obviously having a website is a bigger undertaking than having an Instagram account. And there's obviously like significant revenue and money to be made just from taking on, you know, Instagram deals or TikTok deals and that sort of thing. So I think we see this sort of influencer stick a little bit more to the social media platforms, but sort of as the phenomenon continues to grow. And Lauren, like you said, I think some of these people probably do see their day job revenue or day job salary surpassed by their influencer revenue. Maybe they will start looking more to, okay, I should start a website. I should start a newsletter. Really just having that audience you own, I think is important. But with day job influencers, I think this isn't their full-time job. So they're maybe a little bit slower to that uptake. I'm going to bring up Layla Gohar again, because she just had this profile. I think she's a really good example of all this. 
she launched an e-commerce of tabletop with her sister about six months ago of like tabletop and linens and she, she's a cook, et cetera, et cetera. She has a collaboration with Hay coming out this fall. So in e-commerce, it feels like to me, she is doing very little of the actual influencer work and kind of owning it all herself. So that's the other end of it, but you have to have the infrastructure to be able to do that. James, I wanted to ask you this and Rebecca Davey from London, who is on a train, so she cannot ask her question live said, what considerations should brands take into account when finding or using an influencer? And I am curious to know, what is appealing today? I think there's a, a few parts to it. One, as we think about what matters when like picking an influencer, there's really probably the most important is like, what's the relationship with that audience? Because having an audience does not mean you have influence over them. Having 100,000 followers means you have an audience. It doesn't mean you have a community. It doesn't mean you can influence that community. It might just mean you're genetically gifted and they like following pretty people and they ultimately, or you travel a lot and they, they like to see that on their feed, but it doesn't mean that you listen to them, right? It doesn't mean that you take their advice. And so we start by first saying like, what is the relationship with this audience? Are they creating content in service of their community? Because it's the influencers that that really can drive action generally are those ones that I think are thinking more in service of their community. They're creating content for them. They're thinking about stuff that that audience will find useful. So first is figuring out what's the relationship with that audience? How many of them are they reaching? What do they care about? Do they talk about this stuff? Does my brand fit into this story in any way? And that's the next part is like, we tell brands like, don't spend good money on fake love, right? Why are we paying people to pretend to like stuff that they don't? Why are we paying people to talk about products that make absolutely no sense in their life? And I think this is where the, the day job stuff comes in is that it gives us that other story to pull that brand in where otherwise it maybe wouldn't have made as much sense. Ideally what brands want They want someone who has a great relationship with that audience and it's a community. They're talking to camera a lot, all that stuff, and that they have some pre-existing relationship with the brand. I mean, that's the grail, right? We found someone for Madewell and they've talked about Madewell 50 times in the last year. That's awesome because when they say, hey, everyone, I'm working with Madewell, everyone's going to be like, that's amazing. Instead of like, hey, everyone, super excited to talk about Walmart today, nothing wrong with Walmart. But if you are carrying a Chanel bag and you live in New York, which doesn't have access to a Walmart, that story isn't make sense, right? And creates like what we would call that like authenticity gap. And so we're always trying to kind of manage that authenticity gap and think about how can we find not just an influencer, but the right influencer for this product, for this brand, for this set of KPIs, for this budget in this kind of moment in time. And that's where kind of some of that fun complexity comes in. Lindsay, how are you seeing this play out on your end? Are brands looking for different things and conversion versus engagement and all of that stuff? I think that one of the ways that we really counsel brands to get to this point is to make sure that they're investing in the long game with creators and really sort of thinking about year long campaigns when they can. So we work with the mom edit who is absolutely fantastic. She actually has built her business. She came from like a data background and an engineering background and now has 19 contributors that are working for her. It's wild. I mean, she really has built a publishing business. It's been fantastic. We work really closely to her to sort of secure these longer term relationships because she actively thinks about moving her audience over to a particular brand. It takes a long time, right? And so having these sort of multi-month partnerships really, you know, it's great to have like sort of a big moment around a launch or sort of like a key time of the year. And you want to make sure that you do that as a brand, but you also need to make sure just like James said, right? It's like, it is that authenticity, right? And of course, like all of our influencers are always vetting. I mean, we're not going to ever ask them, nor would honestly any good one say yes to work with a brand that they don't actually believe in, right? So we have to have the product ahead of time. We oftentimes spend one of the kind of like categories that actually really takes a lot of work is beauty because so many of the creators have set beauty routines. They want to make sure they're testing new products. And so we work with new brands that we're really trying to counsel and work with them to get that product seated ahead of time, make sure that, you know, we have creators on board with what that product is, the value that they like it. So it's like, for you know, it's a long process. 
process. You know, we have to send that product to them. Then they have to use it for a month or two. Then we come back and say, how do you like it? You know, is it valuable? Would you want to work with them? So it's not always a flash in the pan and you really have to make sure that you're investing in a long game there. And so we spend a lot of time making sure that as often as we can, we work with brands to sort of have that long game, use multiple metrics in the beginning. It's really about brand engagement. It's about, you know, awareness. And then as you get further down, that's where the sales start to come. Because just like we talked about with the video, it's like, you have to see these things multiple times before you're actually going to convert and buy. Beauty is a really interesting category because in many ways, consumers have to really feel like they trust the creator on what they're recommending. If they feel like they're seeing a new moisturizer from them every week, it's kind of like, do I really believe you? Are you really changing moisturizers every week? People usually are pretty set on those things. So they have to feel like it's really vetted and there's something that's really valuable from that creator and authentic that's coming. Influencers are not a new phenomenon that came out in the last 10 years and are going to somehow go away. They've always existed. It's just the medium or platform in which they disseminated information. There have always been people in culture and society. And my friend, David Marks just wrote this book called status and culture. And it's about this exactly, which is that there always are people who recommend things to other people and there are leaders and followers, et cetera. So I think it's a little philosophical, but you have to think about it that way. It's not going to go away. It will keep evolving but it's not going to totally go away. But Diana, maybe let's start with you. And I'd like to hear from all of you, this sort of surge in brands using more marketing dollars towards influencers, where do you see it evolving essentially? I completely agree with everything you said, Lauren. There have always been people of influence. Now they have like a better platform than ever to wield that influence. I think also with TikTok, it's perhaps like easier to become an influence. In some ways it's harder because there's obviously a huge volume of people, but then we have platforms like TikTok where it's easier than ever to go viral. And overnight you can gain, you know, a hundred thousand followers from, from one great video. But I think there's a difference between having an audience and having influence. And yes, I think we are always going to see people rise and gain a lot of followers, but the ones that are really going to last are the people who are investing in building that trust with their audience having actual influence, taking on partnerships that make sense for them, not just grabbing at every big payday that comes their way. But I do think ultimately, like this is how we are marketed to in a lot of ways. And as we just become more and more like addicted to our phones and on the internet all the time as, as just like a collective society, I think marketing dollars will only continue to just be funneled in this direction, especially as we see more of these sort of establishment influencers, you know, cause people who right now are the hottest, you know, thing on TikTok, the smart ones are planting the seeds for their business that could be lasting for, you know, the next decade, two decades, however long. James, what do you think? We believe that influencer marketing in the next five to 10 years will be the dominant form of brand communication in the world. Like this is it. Like when you think about advertising, they're going to be spending more money on this than anything else. They're going to be spending more time on this than anything else. And I think most brands have probably not fully recognized and understood the impact of all of their customers having a platform. And the fact that like for decades, it's been all about brand storytelling. What story are we telling? And, and we're going to use scaled media to place ads to tell that story. And consumers, they learned about brands from brands, mostly. You were just getting ads. And so like you, heard, whatever the brand was telling you is what you knew about the brand. Well, now they're learning about brands from people. And so your job as a marketer changes from what story am I telling to what story can I encourage other people to tell? How can I curate the stories that people are telling because they're finding out about it from other people? And I think that, you know, as you look at that future five, 10 years from now and say, okay, is the average American consumer or worldwide going to have a bigger or smaller following than they have now bigger? Will they spend more or less time on social than they are today? Probably more. Well, then like this is existential for brands. If they can't figure this out, they won't be able to compete in a decade. And I think smart brands know that and they're they're investing now to make sure that they stay ahead of this and understand that this is going to be absolutely fundamental to their future survival because they're not going to be able to get to 18-year-old kids running ads on a Monday night football game. It's just not going to happen. So like they have to figure this out. If they haven't realized this and they just think it's a fad, they probably will get 
gobbled up by uh, a number of smaller, more nimble influencer first brands over the next decade. Lindsay, any final thoughts? I think it's really so much of how brands need to think about influencer is really about how the fact that the media space is really shifting there, right? I think that that has been happening over the last five, seven years and is just sort of hitting this crescendo. I actually read a really great article from Amy O'Dell. Her Substack came through about how fashion police sort of had died and really picked back up on TikTok because sort of the way that the media is changing and the way that those big media like E and all these other big platforms are really able to interact and have that sort of personal, authentic relationship with the fashion experience and with the red carpet is all moving into these individual voices. And I think so much of what's happening in media and entertainment now is it is all becoming moving into the influencer and the creator space. And so if brands want to continue to be able to reach people, just like James was saying, at scale, they need to think about the media space really moving into the creator world. Influencer marketing is going to be $22 billion, I think, next year. So it's not shrinking. And I think that, you know, despite the fact that two or three years ago when I joined this company, they, you know, everybody was saying, well, you'll hear a lot about how influencer is on its way out. It's like the exact opposite, which is that this is the most authentic way to connect with consumers. It is the original word of mouth marketing. And so why would you invest otherwise? Thank you all for being here. And this was such a great conversation. I hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. You've been listening to The Debrief, produced and edited by Emma Clark, Kate Barton, Eric Bria, and Georgie Rutherford in the BOF studio. I'm Lauren Sherman, and I'll be back next Wednesday with a new episode. Thanks so much for joining us, and be sure to follow us wherever you get your podcasts. You can join BOF Professional today with an exclusive 25% discount on an annual membership covering key industry topics from sustainability to technology to marketing with access to our case studies, live events, and iOS app. To get this special offer and benefit from 25% off of a membership, head to the link in the episode show notes or enter the coupon code DEBRIEF at checkout. Visit businessoffashion.com slash memberships.